I'm Dr. Paul Letterer, and today I would like to talk to you about a condition called amblyopia, typically termed lazy eye. Now, there are many different kinds of lazy eyes. I think most people think of a lazy eye as being easy to see because the eye turn inward or outward, but that is not what we see in clinical practice. That a high percentage of the people with amblyopia or lazy eye actually are hidden. The eye does not turn. And so you don't really know that it exists, which is why I often see these children when they're five or six years of age for school screenings, where we should have seen them earlier. Now, what this means is that we have a prescription that's so different between the two eyes that the child or adult has learned to use one eye, so that the other eye learns to be ignored. Um, I think I learned the most from an 11-year-old girl where I sat at the consultation, and she said, I understand now what this is. She says, that eye's on timeout. And I couldn't have said it better in two hours. It basically means that the brain has learned to ignore the vision in that eye, that it, basically we have a sensory deprivation in the brain from disuse, from no stimulation. We have a motor limitation because the focusing system also becomes affected and the motor movements because this eye is on timeout. And we have perceptual limits. In fact, there's different perceptual characteristics depending on what type of lazy eye you have. Now, another type of lazy eye is the strabismus, we call it. The strabismus lazy eye. This is an eye that does turn inward or outward. When one eye is always the one that's turning, then we usually see that that eye will also go somewhat on timeout that the focusing gets turned off, the eye aiming starts to become distorted, and the vision starts to drop. Now, we don't just look at these conditions as poor sight on a letter chart, because the real deprivation happens when the focusing system is poor, the reaction time is poor, they're not aware of that field of vision, they're running across the street, and their ball's going out there, and the left eye is the lazy eye, and they're not aware of that field of vision that makes them more vulnerable, where they are aware of their peripheral vision with the right eye. It's those things that throw off their depth perception, that make 3D movies difficult, where they get frustrated that they can't appreciate that. It's these issues that make lazy eyes so very important. Because what we do see is that when we have this type of condition, their depth perception is affected. Their eye teeming is pronounced and reduced for many. Others, these conditions are intermittent, much more subtle. But you see, the thing I've always found interesting is the ones that are subtle, the ones that are intermittent, often have more difficulty with these conditions because there's more rivalry between the two eyes. And this is why they're more symptomatic. They have more loss of place in reading or more headaches or more difficulty judging space. Yet, because they're intermittent, they're more treatable. Cases that are more embedded learn to shut down that weak eye so efficiently that despite not having depth perception, they don't have any problems reading in a two-dimensional world. But it's those cases where the two eyes are close enough to argue with each other and that they argue. But often, as that argument occurs, you see symptoms of head tilt moving in. They learn a capacity to be able to shut down one eye. And this can be done posturally as well as the brain helping. All these things go on with a child with a lazy eye. The sports become an issue. And the child starts to feel they're clumsy and they're not good at those sports. And it's very difficult to get a child back when they've learned that those things are difficult and the kids have laughed, especially those children that are sharp and almost a bit of a perfectionist within them, where they avoid it if they've experienced bad, bad difficulty with it. So I so am concerned about the way these lazy eyes are underdiagnosed early, are undertreated. Patching alone and the use of glasses does not bring back the vision. It's the way the two eyes have to work together that gives a reason for two eyes to have more than just one eye alone for the dominant eye. And it's this ability to develop back this coordination, to bring back this sensory perceptual motor loss and function. To give this child control of their visual system, improved depth, improved ability in sports, to see symptoms that are getting in the way of them reading in school and sustaining longer concentrated activities in school. The accidents, the misjudging in space that puts them so at risk for difficulties when they can't really judge where an object is in space. These become the things that are the most beautiful about the recovery of children with lazy eye. Lazy eye is a treatable condition, and it is a treatable condition at any age, but each case is unique. Each case has to be looked at its own merit. Some children have very embedded conditions, 
and some adults are easily treatable. The question isn't just bringing back the vision. The real question is, what is it giving them in life that makes their life more fulfilling, that gives them less symptoms, that makes them more efficient and comfortable, that puts them in control of what the visual system is operating and doing, rather than the visual system controlling them. And it's this ability to give the patient control and understanding that is the foundation upon which I like to help educate the patient as to the capacity of what vision is about, the way in which vision can help them, the way in which we can improve these things through diagnostic assessment that indicates prognosis or capacity to improve. These are the great gains that we can achieve to understand the capacity of someone to be able to do things in a more efficient and comfortable way.